Hi, my name is Boris, I'm 21 years old, I work in manufacturing and I drive a 1997 Mazda 323F. I got into cars when I was very young, I must have been like four or five years old. I think the passion mainly came from, uh, from my dad. He wasn't really as big into cars as I am, but he always told me, Boris, when you're older, I can see you driving a nice car, blah, blah, blah. And then I still remember when I was like maybe five or six years old, I got my uh, first model car that I remember clearly. It was, it was a red Ferrari 360 Modena. And that's kind of what kickstarted my passion for cars. And then as I got older, I kind of thought, yeah, I actually want to do this. And then when I got around to about 18, I should have been making my license, but unfortunately my passport was expired, so I had to renew that first. And then when we finally got through that, my first car was a Mark 1 Ford KA. Don't judge, it was a great car. A bit rusty, but it handled like a wasp. Like, honestly, there were some back roads where I left my mates in like Mark 4 Golfs, and I was just laughing at them. Like, ah, you got gapped by a KA, how do you feel? For me, the car community is a fantastic thing. There's not much else that I can compare it with, except maybe the only thing that's really comparable is bikes, because everyone else, the beauty of it is the fact that everyone has a different car. Normal people just see them as, oh yeah, I got a car, whatever, it gets me from A to B, but normal people just will not understand that because they can't feel a connection between themselves and the car they drive. Whereas for people like me or anyone else who would enjoy uh, owning cars is there's more to it than that. The way I see it, when you've got a car that you've wanted to own for a while or it was something you've been thinking of for any, any kind of amount of time, when you have a car that you like and you have a connection with it, it goes beyond just thinking, okay, I'm gonna maintain this, I'm gonna clean it every set amount of time. It then gets into, okay, can I improve this car? Can I imprint a bit of myself onto the car? With, with my little Mazda, I've got JDM MX-5 rims, a two and a quarter inch cap back, and it's been lowered by 40 mil. And I did those with the thought in the back of my mind that I'm imprinting something on the car that's never been there before, simply because it's not something this car would have seen because looking at the past owners, they were either elderly or they didn't, care about cars. I can't get away from cars. It's something that I think about every second. Either do I want to go for a drive, do I want to meet my mates and go for a run, do I want to go to a car meet, do I want to improve anything on the car further, and that's the great thing about it, that normal people just will not understand un unless you get them to try it, because if they do, and you explain the theory to them behind it, why you do things to your car in a certain way, only at that point might they actually understand why we love what we do. Being around the community gives you a feeling of togetherness. It doesn't just feel like you're at a car meet. Sometimes it feels like you're actually part of a massive family, either because you just like the people for who they are or Maybe it's some people who want to be supportive of you. They see you, that you want to accomplish something with your car, or maybe you want to do something with it in the future. And in that sense, the car community for me is something that once you get into it, it's very hard to get out of, and I don't see a reason why I'd want to leave. I see it as I see it this way. Uh, we get villainized quite often because we all get rolled into one. No matter what we drive, no matter what we do for a living, that gets us the cars that we have. Um, the stereotype behind boy racers, it's I'd say it's semi-accurate because it is a stereotype based on a kernel of truth. Because there definitely are some people out there who drive. Let's just say they're people who I don't feel should have a license because they take it a bit too far. I'm all for enjoying a car for what it is and going for a nice drive, but if you're going to do that, you need to have a level head about it because if you're doing it in an area which is quite busy or you pose a danger to the public, then A, you should go to a different road and two, you need to know the difference between 
having fun and endangering someone's life. Because if you're, if you're driving on your own and you're just enjoying it, that's fine as long as there's no one else on the road. But when we start mixing uh, public traffic into the question, then there is no excuse for that kind of driving. In terms of how the media portrays us, it's just another way for them to try and get back at us. Normal people don't like modified cars. The reason for that, I think, is because typically the modifications we do are ones that they wouldn't do themselves. It's, it's very complicated as a question. Uh, they don't really see the point of, oh, this guy has a loud car, why does he do it? We do it because cars in general, but for me specifically because I have an old car myself, the reason that we do what we do to our cars is because we want to imprint a bit of ourselves into the car's history. Because, sure, you know, a normal person might say, oh yeah, these two cars are the same because they're the same model. But in reality, they're not because they've been owned by completely different people. The first person, let's say that you have two cars, car A and car B. Car A was owned by people who had no interest in cars and just wanted it to be reliable transportation. That is just a regular car. But if you have the same car and it's been owned by someone who loves what they do and they want to modify it, then that in a sense is a bit different because what they're doing is what they love and I don't see why we should be villainizing ourselves for our passions. Oh, 100%. Uh, what was it? When I was maybe 15, 16, I was not confident at all. I was normally the kind of guy who just kind of enjoy things from afar. I'd be there, I'd see a nice car, I'd be like, oh, he's got some nice rims on there. And that's all I'd say. But now uh, I can literally start a conversation with anyone. I can just walk up to their car. Yeah, I like it. And then conversation goes from there. Pollution, to me, I don't really think is that much down to cars. Of course, there's millions of them on the road and we use them every day. But <laughs> if we're going to get into detail, the biggest polluters are planes and ships. So you'd have to try and work solutions on those rather than cars. Because, for example, now, modern engines are so sophisticated that I'm going to give a example just to back myself up. The new Toyota Corolla has a 2-litre engine which can run on normal 95-octane fuel and has a compression ratio of 13 to 1. Ten or so years ago, that wasn't possible on a petrol engine, but it's clever engineering that's got us there to a point where we can now have cars that sip petrol or diesel and don't pollute that much. You can even take cars from about 15 years ago or so well, not maybe 15, but cars like the Toyota Igo, Citroen C1, and the Peugeot 107, because they're the same kind of thing, those cars produce such little emissions that you don't even pay road tax. And those are petrol cars with no turbos, because turbos nowadays are not really used for performance like they used to be used in the 80s, 90s, noughties. Now they're just used to, um, to hit very stringent emissions targets. Um, the thing is that I see as a problem is the fact that Governments are slowly starting to encroach on our territory. They're slowly starting to set out rules which are going to make our lives harder. For example, I read not too long ago that in a few months there's going to be heavier taxes on people who drive diesel and petrol cars. And that is a step in the completely wrong direction because the majority of cars out there are still powered by either diesel or petrol. So what's the point of trying to make the life of the working man harder to try and get him to feel pressured into thinking, oh, I've got to buy a hybrid, I've got to buy electric, when that shouldn't be the case. I think we should be allowed to drive whatever we want, and that really should be the end of it. Well, I mean, I've had some, I've had some bad run-ins with the ULES zone. Since my car's quite old, I need to pay ULES whenever I drive in there, and, Sometimes I'm visiting some mates in London and it does get very annoying, the fact that, oh, you're driving to London? 13 quid, mate. No matter what day of the week it is, or even if it's Christmas, it still applies to you. But I don't see that as a problem because there are some cars which were made in the noughties that still conform to ULES. As an example, um, someone that I know has a 2005 uh, Ford Mondeo with a 2.5-litre two, two V6. 
and that is still compliant of you, Les. As for why they're expanding the zone, I'm not an expert in this field, but if they feel that's the right move, they can do that, but at the same time, they should be prepared for backlash from car enthusiasts. We live in a very uncertain time right now. People are confused whether should you buy electric, should you stay with your old car? And the way I see it, stay with your old car because electric cars are still very new. The technology behind them has not been refined quite yet. As an example, if you buy said car, like an ID3, for example, its maximum range is about 250 to 300 miles. That's, that is not good because if you, if you drive long journeys, you might not even make it on a single charge. So what are you going to tell your boss? Well, listen, man, I've got, I got to stop off because I've got to charge my car. I'll be at work in uh, three hours. So it's just, I don't see the point of that. Whereas if you've got a petrol or diesel, you fill it up to the brim and you drive quite a bit further. And at the same time, making electric cars, at the moment at least, simply is not viable because of, hmm, Here's a funny little controversy. They say electric cars are being made to be more sustainable and because they don't pollute the environment at all. It's carbon neutral or what they say, but to make a single electric car, it takes a load of more emissions than driving whatever you drive now for a whole year. And in that sense, I don't see their point at all because it's like they're half agreeing to what they said themselves. Because if they say, Oh uh, yeah, I got an electric car, it makes no emissions, I love it. Yeah, but to make it, it took a lot more of emissions, you know, when they, when they were producing the car. The way I see it, um, the future should not be focused on electric cars, it should either be focused on hydrogen or, or Porsche, who are developing uh, synthetic petroleum. And if that succeeds, then the electric car will be a completely obsolete piece of technology. Because if Porsche succeed in what they're doing, every single petrol pump everywhere can be replaced with that synthetic fuel. And all you need to do then is convert whatever car you have to run on said fuel. And when it does, electric cars are going to become a pointless novel idea. And even, even more so, it's like car makers aren't learning from past mistakes because when electric cars were starting to become a thing in the late 2000s, there was a small company called Fisker, and they made a car called the Karma. Very nice looking car, I will, I will admit, but the car was an absolute disaster. It sold very poorly. It was extremely expensive. It was, I think, close to about £100,000 new. And you've got to ask yourself, is that worth buying when in, in, in opposite of that, you could get yourself something like, well, obviously I'm a car guy, so I'll say something, you could buy yourself an M5 for that money plus an M3 as an example. So why would you spend all that money on something which isn't refined yet and you're not even sure if it will be reliable enough in the future? I don't think they could be. Uh, mainly because most car enthusiasts have uh, a desire to make their cars drive better, drive nicer or go faster. And if we want to go faster, that does not go hand in hand with environmentalism. Because the second that, you know, you can have the most efficient car you want, but if you get to a point where you think, okay, I'm going to make it faster, environmentalism goes completely out the window. And when it does so, I don't really think that you could say you're an envi environmentalist if you're also a car enthusiast, because most of the time we like to enjoy our cars. Enjoying our cars means we typically drive them a bit faster. And that's why I don't really see why car enthusiasts could be environmentalists. You could, sure, you could get like an electric car, but at that point, we're going a bit off track here, but at that point, if you're having an electric car, which makes no noise and has hardly any involvement in driving, how are you going to enjoy that experience when you have no engine noise, and the only thing you can hear is the sound of your tires rolling on the road. I don't see how you'd find that interesting or fun. People who don't understand why we do what we do, until they try it, they simply won't know. And if you try and get them into it, 
they might not become car enthusiasts, but at least they will understand why we have the passion that we do and why we do what we love.